Hello again. Welcome to A Little Book Open. We're studying the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Only 12 chapters, but jam-packed with information about God and His love and His plan. Now, we find that the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, was written by people from varied backgrounds over a period of about 16 centuries. There was Moses, the lawgiver. There was Paul, the scholar. Luke, the beloved physician. David, the shepherd. And many others that contributed to the writing of the scriptures. But who would believe that a major portion of the Bible, an entire chapter, would be written by someone who was not merely a resident of Babylon, but its king, King Nebuchadnezzar himself? Who would believe that? And yet that's what we find in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, the chapter that we'll be engaging in our study today as we begin. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us this wonderful book that tells us about your incessant, relentless love and search for sinners to win to your kingdom and how that is illustrated in the life story of Nebuchadnezzar. So, dear Lord, we pray as we study this chapter that we'll see that love clearly and we'll recognize that that love is reaching out to us as well today so that we can be part of your family enjoying the eternal kingdom you are preparing for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. I'm Pastor John Anderson, and we're looking at the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel, the story that tells of the conversion of King Nebuchadnezzar, and what a story it is. The Bible tells us that God reaches out to nations and kingdoms on the global scale, the large scale, but he also reaches out to individuals, and that's an important thing to see. And it's the very same thing today. God is, of course... Uh, interested and concerned with the nations of this world as they battle through various challenges. But he's also interested in your life and in my life individually. The Bible says that he knows the very hairs of our head. The Bible says that not a sparrow falls, but that God doesn't take note. So in this story, we're, we're seeing how God is reaching out to one person. That person is, Nicodem is uh, Nebuchadnezzar. I mentioned the name Nicodemus because his story also brings out that truth. You remember in the third chapter of the book of John, Jesus made a statement that has gone around the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Who hasn't heard that verse? And yet, to what audience was that, that verse spoken? Was it to an audience of thousands? No, it was an audience of one. And that person was Nicodemus. That's in the third chapter of John. In the fourth chapter, we see again, we see God's, reach, God's love reaching out to a single individual. Now in John chapter 3, it's Nicodemus. He's a Jew. He's a man. He's of high stature, of lofty position, well-educated. In John chapter 4, it's a woman. It's a Samaritan woman. A woman whose life has been scarred uh, and blemished by poor choices. And yet, God's love is reaching out to that lady. And she became, arguably, one of the most successful evangelists in history. Read the story in John chapter 4. When she gave her testimony, the whole town came to learn about Jesus. So God is interested in the big picture, the global scene, as well as the little picture, the individual. That involves you and me. And we find that in the fourth chapter of the book of Daniel. We also see that he's interested in classes, whether they're wealthy, whether they're privileged, or, or not. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, had all of the advantages that you could possibly, possibly dream about. God's love reached out to him. Sometimes we're tempted to pass by the rich thinking that, well, they're not going to be interested. They have everything they need. They don't want religion. They don't want to know about God or the Bible. But that should not uh, cause us to hesitate to share our faith with all people, no matter what their station in life, what their background, what their, what their life might be like. God wanted to rescue Nebuchadnezzar. And the word rescue is intentionally used there because he was in trouble. Now, uh, as we read the beginning of the chapter, it, it may not seem that way, uh, but Nebuchadnezzar was in deep trouble because he was affected, he was, infl he was inflicted with a very deadly virus, a spiritual virus called pride. And that was the very, very same thing that caused the fall of Lucifer. We see a parallel between the, the life experience of Lucifer and Nebuchadnezzar in many respects. Thankfully, not all respects, but in many respects. But we see that Lucifer was privileged and honored 
He was like a monarch. Angels loved to obey his commands, but he indulged pride. He cherished that, uh, that virus in his life until eventually it brought about his destruction. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was affected by the virus of pride, the virus of sin. But nevertheless, God was going to reach out to him. He was going to try to rescue him because he knew that he could be successful if Nebuchadnezzar would just open his heart to him. I remember hearing a sermon by one of the great preachers in Adventist heritage, Morris Venden. It's always stuck with me, and I find that it applies to the story that we're talking about here, the story of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. The title of the sermon that Morris, Morris Venden put together was Four Things God Doesn't Know. Now that's an intriguing title because usually we think of God of knowing everything. God is omniscient. He has all wisdom. So how could there possibly be four things that God doesn't know? But as he, as he uh, went through the sermon, uh, I, found myself, I found myself agreeing with what he was saying. Four things that God doesn't know. God doesn't know a sin he doesn't hate. That's true. God doesn't know a sinner he doesn't love. That's true. You know, sometimes we get those things backward. We love sin and we hate sinners. God has, has it in the correct order. He hates sin because he knows it's lethal. That's the only reason that God hates sin, because he knows it's deadly. God hates sin, but he loves sinners. God doesn't know a sin he doesn't hate, a sinner he doesn't love, a person he can't save. Now there again, the devil comes to us and tempts us, maybe about our own life. Maybe he says, you've gone too far. You've crossed the line. God's not interested in you anymore. You've committed the unpardonable sin. Is that true? Well, if you're watching this program and you're opening your heart to God, we know that that's not true, that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. God doesn't, God, God doesn't know a person that he can't save, and God doesn't know a better time than now. How true that is. Satan who says, okay, maybe, maybe it is true, but... Uh, 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 deal with it tomorrow. Be like Felix. Uh, wait for a more convenient season to uh, turn to God and become a Christian. No, God doesn't know a better time than now because none of us has a guarantee about tomorrow. Our life could come to an end. Our probation could close at any moment. And where will our eternal destiny be then? We must make a decision for Jesus today because we have no guarantees for tomorrow. So God's love reaching out to this king King Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible is the story of God's love. Now, when the New Testament was written, there were many different words in the Greek language that could have been used to convey the idea of love. I'll share with you about six of them. Uh, there was the word philia. It comes into our language as a prefix P-H-I-L attached to hundreds, maybe thousands of words. Philosophy, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, and so on. Phil. Uh, Phil, in that sense, means um, uh, an emotional friendship type of love, a, a barter system. You be nice to me, I'll be nice to you. But if you cross me, then look out. We're not friends anymore. That's philia. The, the New Testament language has the word eros in it. We get a word in our English language. From that, it is the word erotic. Now, some people, when they hear the word erotic, they think only of the negative side of that, and it's true that that is a word that does describe uh, aspects of evil. But on the other hand, love in the physical way is something that God created. God created male and female, Adam and Eve, and he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. So is there is a godly sense of physical love. And if you read the scriptures, clearly that will come through in the Old and New Testament. Philia, friendship love. Eros, love on the physical plane. Storge is family love. Love that a father might have toward his son or a mother, her child. Ludos. Ludos uh, expressed the idea of playful love. That would be like flirting or something like that. Playful love. That root comes into our language. You might be surprised when you hear what the word is, but it's the word ludicrous. That comes from ludos. Playful love. Then we have another word that I, I can't imagine how it can be seen in a positive sense. It's the word mania. Our English word mania, maniac, comes from that. And that refers to compulsive love, love that has crossed the line. Now, beside those words, uh, they were the ones that were not used 
when the New Testament describes God's love. It was the word agape that New, Te New Testament authors chose. That word was really not in wide usage at the time the New Testament was written. Why? Well, it was a word that, that was expressed by poets and philosophers, and it was used to describe this idealistic love that was thought really not to exist. This selfless, pure uh, essence of love. And yet that's the word that the New Testament uses. It's as if the New Testament's authors were saying to the world about them, you've heard about this word love that uh, describes love in this, this uh, high realm, this ideal, idealistic sense. Let me tell you what that is. That's Jesus. Jesus living out in his flesh, God's love, God's agape love. So it's interesting that in the Bible it says not only that God loves, God has demonstrates this agape love, it goes even beyond that. It says that God is love. And that's a stronger way, a more emphatic way of saying that. He is the very essence. He is the personification. This love that you thought was unattainable, there it is, exhibited in the life of Jesus. And that love is going to be manifested toward King Nebuchadnezzar. Afflicted though he was with the virus of sin and pride, the Lord was going to reach out to him because God doesn't know a person he can't save. God doesn't know a better time than now. So we're going to read the first couple of verses of Daniel chapter 4. And Nebuchadnezzar does not leave us in doubt. He immediately uh, comes forward with his testimony of how God has changed his life. Let's read these verses. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. In other words, he says, I've experienced this change in my life. I'm not going to keep quiet about it. I want everybody to know. Everybody in the world, he says there, all languages of those that dwell in the land. I'm going to declare it. I want you to hear my testimony. And it's a very personal testimony. He's going to share the signs and the wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. You know, your personal testimony is the most powerful thing you can share with your friends. They may argue with you about doctrine. They may uh, get into a discussion about different points of view, but they can't argue about your personal experience. When you tell people what God has done for you, that's something that can't be controverted. And for every Bible Christian, there is a testimony. If you have nothing to share, then you need to pray to God to give you something to share, something that he has worked in your life. I used to be this. I used to be on that pathway. I used to be going in that direction. But God changed me and put me on a, on, a, on a different road. Everyone has a testimony who has been brought to the Lord and accepted Jesus as their Savior. Nebuchadnezzar continues. He says, How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You know, that's the story between Daniel 2 and Daniel 3. The statue dream said that God's picture was that there would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Nebuchadnezzar didn't like that. He thought that it was going to be Babylon forever. Ba Babylon was going to be everlasting. But through, as the story works out, he comes to see that God's plan is different and it is best to accept God's plan. And so he says his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. So right at the beginning of, of this chapter, he puts forth his testimony. He doesn't want there to be any ambiguity or confusion about where he is now. I used to be this, but now I'm this. But how did I get there? That's the interesting part of the story that we're going to take a look at now. So we start at verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest. And that word means to be serene, to be tranquil, uh, undisturbed. I was at rest in my house or my kingdom. And because Nebuchadnezzar had been so successful in his conquests, his uh, milita military endeavors, uh, it was a time now of peace, and he was enjoying that tranquility. I was at rest in my house. I was flourishing in my palace. Now, this is a most interesting word. Uh, in Hebrew, the word literally means green. Green. Now, it would sound strange uh, for someone to say, I hope you're green, because uh, that might either mean that you're sick or that you're indulging jealousy and envy or something else. It's sometimes green is used as a figurative, figurative symbol. Uh, but the sense of the word here means I was flourishing like a healthy plant. I was growing. I was strong. I was verdant. I was, I was beautiful. 
The English word flourishing is a perfect word to translate this Hebrew word because it means actually to be like a flower, to be green like a plant. Years ago when we moved into our house, uh, I've tried to grow various things. Now we've had uh, apricot trees that we planted that did very, very well for a number of years. These were, they produced huge, sweet, juicy apricots so abundantly that we ended up uh, freezing many and giving, giving, giving them away uh, as much as we could. But I wanted to grow avocados. Where I live is considered to be, you know, the avocado capital of the, of the world almost. But I never could do it. I tried once. I planted, I don't know, two or three trees, and they, they died out. They did, hardly lasted a year. I tried again a couple years later, same thing. Didn't work out. Years went by. So I thought now, and I believe it was about a year and a half ago or so, I thought, I'm going to try once more. I'm going to go to a different area of my yard, and I'm going to plant a number of avocado trees. I'm going to try again. So I did, and I planted five or six avocado trees. I can tell you that now when I walk into my, out into my yard, it, it just does my heart good to see those trees. They're the dark, rich green color. They're growing tall in the air. They're producing some fruit, even though they're young. And it just uh, puts a smile on my face when I see uh, how, how healthy these trees look. That's the image that Nebuchadnezzar is, is uh, drawing for us here. I was in my house, I was at rest, and I was flourishing like a prosperous, fruitful green tree. That image is a perfect segue, a perfect link to the uh, dream slash prophecy that Nebuchadnezzar was going to be given by the Lord. Because in that very vision, he is going to be compared to a flourishing tree. And yet, Something is going to happen to that tree that uh, causes Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar to be disturbed. So let's look at that here in Daniel chapter 4 and um, the end of the, uh, verse 5. I saw a dream. It made me afraid. The thoughts on my head and the visions of my head troubled me. Now the word troubled there is a word that is scattered throughout the narrative of the book of Daniel. Uh, uh, it's used there in chapter 2, in chapter 3. It's used uh, here in chapter 4. It's going to be in chapter 5 again when, Nebuch when Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall and various places. That's actually used twice in this chapter. It's used here where Nebuchadnezzar was troubled when he saw the, saw the dream but didn't know its meaning. Later in the chapter when Daniel is given the dream and its meaning, it says that he is troubled by it. So uh, interesting connection there. So he's flourishing in his palace. Things are going so well that he falls asleep one night. He has this dream. It's of a, of a tree. And it says, it troubled me. So what's he going to do? Where is he going to go to find the answers as to what this dream means? Oh, there's such a powerful sermon in the uh, approach, uh, experience of Nebuchadnezzar in this part of the story. What does it say there? Verse 6. Therefore, I issued a decree... To bring in, what's the next word there? If you have your Bible open, a decree to bring in all the wise men. Now stop there for just a second. As you recall the stories of the book of Daniel as we've been reading them, you recall the fact that Daniel was actually brought into the company of the wise men. And in fact, he was even appointed to be their leader. He was the chief of the Magi, it says. And yet, as we go through the story, we find that Daniel's not included in this first group that comes in to try to decipher, decode the dream that the king had. Why? Well, I think the answer really is very simple. And it is that we're all born with selfish natures. And in our, our unconverted selfish state, we have plans and we have designs and we have an agenda for our life. And it's going in one direction. The way that God wants to lead us is the way toward truth and righteousness and the same kind of love that he has. And these are at war one with another. Our, our selfish nature is hostile. It is in, at enmity against God's principles. And when Nebuchadnezzar uh, saw this dream, he recognized something in it that uh, seemed to conflict with his own approach toward life. And so it says he was disturbed. He was troubled. And that's why I believe he didn't call Daniel in. 
because even though Daniel was the one who had come through in all the other uh, episodes that have taken place, he was hoping that his own wise men, his own astrologers, could come up with an answer that would satisfy him. But that was not to be. I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Verse 7, the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me the interpretation. Now notice we're right in the middle of a progression here. The progression is that in chapter 2, the king gets a dream. He knows it's something of significance, but he can't remember it when he wakes up. Then, of course, the Lord reveals it to Daniel, the dream and its message. In this story, the king remembers the dream, but he can't figure it out, and the wise men fail as they did back in chapter 2. Now, in the next chapter, when we get to it, chapter 5, it's not going to be a dream at all. It's not going to be something that you see at night. It's going to be blazing letters on the palace wall, written by a bloodless hand. And yet, when all the wise men are brought in, except Daniel, they can't figure it out. And this illustrates the fact that God is the one that has the answers. And we can weary ourselves to try to find the answer with other sources. And the world today offers many sources that are, are futile, futile and deceptive. What we need to know as Bible Christians is that God has the answers. And when we come to the fork in the road, we don't want to be like Nebuchadnezzar was earlier in his life when it describes him in Ezekiel. He approached the fork in the road. Should I go this way or should I go that way? What does he do? He consults with all of the paraphernalia that are offered to him by, by his uh, false religious sources, studying livers and uh, uh, arrows when they're shaken out onto the ground and, and so on. The Lord would teach us the lesson to go to him first to find the answers and not try to find our answers in these other sources that proved to be unsatisfactory. There's two stories in the Bible I want to share with you that illustrate this point. King Ahab was king of the northern kingdom of Israel. So he should have known. He should have known about the true God. And at this point of his life, um, it even follows the story of what happened on Mount Carmel. And if you remember that story, the fire fell when Elijah prayed and Jehovah demonstrated that he was the true God. The, the God of Baal uh, could not produce fire and consume the sacrifice. So Ahab should have known about the true God. And yet in uh, chapter 22 of 1 Kings, we're told a story that he's going to join forces with the king of Judah, whose name was Jehoshaphat, and together they're, they're going to go and try to reacquire some territory that had been theirs before but had been lost the territory of Ramoth Gilead. And so before they go to battle, as they're making their plans, uh, the question is asked is, well, uh, are there some prophets that we can acquire as to whether this was going to be a successful endeavor? And so Ahab brings in a parade of hundreds of prophets, and they all say the same thing. Yes, go forward. You'll be successful. You'll be victorious. Everything is going to be fine. Something in Jehoshaphat's mind, though, uh, is unsettled. And he says, uh, have you brought in all the prophets? Is there anyone else that uh, can come and, and uh, give, give us a message from the Lord? And Ahab gives an answer that is very, very sad uh, when, you, when you hear it. Now remember, Ahab is king of Israel, God's covenant people, though they were in rebellion at that time. But he should have known. But listen to what he says. We're reading from 1 Kings 22, 7 and 8. There's still one man. His name is Micaiah, the son of Imlah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. Why? Because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Now, was that actually true in real life? Did Micaiah, the son of Imlah, Imla, God's prophet, really uh, pronounce evil and not good? God's messages from the prophets were always uh, tuned to bring good and not evil, if people were willing to, to abide by the principles of God's kingdom. But because Ahab's life at that time was out of touch, out of tune with God's principles, he interpreted what Micaiah, the son of Imla, had to say as being evil and not good. Now, it turns out in this story that what Micaiah said was the truth and would have saved Ahab's life. What did he say? He said, don't go into battle, paraphrasing. I saw Israel scattered like sheep on a hillside with no shepherd. But nevertheless, they went by the counsel of the other prophets. Ahab, Jehoshaphat went into battle and Ahab died in that battle. He should have listened to the word of the Lord that was given. He turned first to the other source, 
And then finally, at the last, all right, let's listen to Micaiah. But uh, uh, it turned out to be disastrous for him. Now, later, after Ahab died, his son took the throne, and his name was Ahaziah. And we read just a few chapters later, 2 Kings chapter 1, that Ahaziah found himself in need. He fell through a lattice, through a window, and injured himself. He was sick, and he wanted to know if he was going to recover from that illness. So what is he going to do? Is he going to think back about the stories of Israel's past and more recently the story of his own father uh, in, in uh, conjunction with, with the ministry of Elijah and how that it's best to turn to the Lord to find the answer? Is that what he's going to do? No. He sends messengers to Philistia, the place where, where Jehovah's name was not honored. And he's going to find an answer from uh, the God of the people of Ekron, Beelzebub. And this, this was disappointing to God. He had to interrupt the story at that point. And so he sent the prophet Elijah to him. And this is what Elijah had to say to Ahaziah. He said, Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of, the, God of Ekron? What a sad question that is. And yet we find this illustrated in the story of Nebuchadnezzar and too often in our own lives. Rather than turning to the Lord when we come to the fork in the road, we seek out our own answers. We try to find solutions from other sources rather than going to the one who has all the answers and all the solutions. But that's what Nebuchadnezzar did. He counseled with the soothsayers, the magicians, the astrologers, and they didn't have an answer for him. And so that's why it says in verse 8, but at last Daniel came before me. Let, not, let that verse not be the testimony of our lives. Whenever we have a problem, whenever we have a challenge, whenever we have a question and we don't know the answer, let's not make it the last. Let's make it the first resource to find out what God's wisdom is for us. Now, it turned out that in this story, God's love is reaching out to Nebuchadnezzar and we find out that that God is going to win. He's going to win the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. And one day, by God's grace, we can meet him up there. And what a tremendous privilege and joy it will be to hear the testimony, not as we read it from the Bible, Daniel chapter 4, but as we hear it coming from the very lips of this converted king, King Nebuchadnezzar, once steeped in pride and sin, now converted a faithful servant of the Most High. May that be our experience. Tune in next time as we continue our study of this wonderful fourth chapter. We find out exactly how it happened that Nebuchadnezzar was converted. converted. The road had some bumps in it, some detours, but the end result was very successful. May God be with you as we continue our study in A Little Book Open here on Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. <laughs>